How could we possibly measure the value of anyone's time or effort using a measurement unit that is constantly changing in value? It's a crazy way of looking at running an economy, and yet most of us do it without giving it a second thought. Our guest today is the author of a thought piece called Bitcoin is the Standard Measurement of Human Productivity. And he's joining us for a conversation about how Bitcoin can transition to something similar to the metric system for value exchange. Bram Kanstein is the host of the Bitcoin for Millennials podcast and is someone who's filled with ideas about how the world works differently, operating on a unit of measurement that makes sense. I'm Scott Deedles. I'm the CEO and founder of Block Rewards. And part of our mission in bringing Bitcoin to the workplace is helping people understand how it will help them. So if you're interested to learn something about why a standard unit of measurement for human productivity makes sense, stick around. This one's a lot of fun. All right, welcome to another episode of the Block Reward Podcast. Our guest this week is Bram Kanstein from the Bitcoin for Millennials podcast. And uh, welcome to the show, Bram. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for, for having me on. Uh, fun to chat after uh, talking on Twitter for a while. So uh, happy to be here. Absolutely. So you've been on your own journey. You know, we, I, uh, I gave this presentation in Montreal about uh, Bitcoin is synchronizing human consciousness. And it's funny, you came into my field of awareness originally because we started our podcast at about the same time. And we actually have a very synchronistic episode list of guests. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but we we've we have had like maybe at least 10 times the same person on our on our respective shows within a week or two of each other. So something was going on. We were we were meant to have this conversation. And finally, here we are. Love that. Yeah, it's uh, it's not a coincidence. Right. I think uh, that's also what, what you talk about a lot. But there is a this this Bitcoin mind virus is uh, growing and progressing. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to see that there are so many synchronicities. Uh, there also, I think, in the messaging about Bitcoin. No, it's less less technical, less explanatory. It's more, I think, about, you know, what are we actually solving? What should people realize about well, fiat money and, and, and all the implications of still adopting fiat money? You had done a lot of different things before you became a Bitcoin podcaster. Uh, what, what, what was the story like? What what motivated you to take action and uh, and start Bitcoin for Millennials? Yeah, so I started in uh, September uh, 2023, and I think in in June of that year. So I've been in Bitcoin for for ten years, but on and off. So for, from 2013, I always say, you know, like I bought at 400. And I sold everything at 4,000 based on my understanding at that time. I felt great about it at that time, but now I have less Bitcoin than I had before, right? So uh, never never sell, I think, is a, big, is a big lesson there. But, you know, I think the understanding went up and down as as for everyone. You know, 99.9% of people do not, get understand, do not understand Bitcoin, you know, at the, at the first uh, go or the first cycle. So, uh, yeah, your understanding comes and goes with, with waves, uh, I did a lot of shit coining and all the ICOs and NFTs and all these things. But then I think like early 2023, I converted like I, I, like I had some Bitcoin still, but I converted like all the NFTs, all the things I gathered to to Ethereum and then to Bitcoin, and was like, okay, I I know that Bitcoin is the only thing that I should pay attention to. And it was also because I heard a guy called Bob Burnett on on a, a podcast that he said, you know, Bitcoin is the biggest thing that you could contribute to in your life. And he's like, I don't know, 66 or 65. And he's like, I'm going to spend the rest of my life on this. And I was like, if he's doing that, you know, I that, that sounds very inspiring. It was very inspiring for me. And I thought, yeah, I want to I wanna do that too, because I had been... Uh, so I don't have a finance or economics background, but those dimensions of Bitcoin I've been diving in for for the past four years, like way more than I did before. First, I was more around the technical part or around, you know, my understanding was around, you know, the internet needs a currency, that's Bitcoin, et cetera. But I think the going down that economic and fi- finance path and and find more reasoning for why Bitcoin should exist and the problem that it solves. Uh, yeah, pushed me more in that direction. And then I saw Bob say that and I was like, okay, yes, 
yes, I, I, I don't know, felt like a calling in some sense. And uh, I think I wrote, I wrote a little essay on Twitter, I think June 2023 about, you know, this is my, this is my coming out as a Bitcoin evangelist. And that went super viral. I don't know, I think like 600,000 views or something. Very interesting to see that my my view on Bitcoin resonated with so many people. And then in the months after, I had uh, I had two weeks uh, after each other. First week, I had uh, like three calls with other Bitcoiners I knew from the internet. And we had like really nice conversations where at the end I was like, hmm, I should have should have could have recorded this and shared this you know like just fun exploring conversations around different dimensions of bitcoin but i didn't think more about it i didn't think about starting a podcast but then the week after i had conversations with with three friends at different times also millennials um two guys who are fairly well off they sold their their company so they got a big reward and i always talk with them about bitcoin you know i beg them to buy bitcoin at 5k <laughs> I, I just i'm always like you know you you should you should get something but they didn't have any bitcoin and with one of those guys i went to so i had three separate conversations but with one of those guys i went on a on a trip and uh, we were in the car for two hours and i said you know we are going to talk about bitcoin like i want you to understand this bitcoin thing and he built a company for for a few years and then he sold it like this is a guy who would like sleep under his desk you know, like really struggle and try and hustle. And well, eventually he got a reward. But yeah, that reward is now entirely in a bank account. <laughs> and I asked him like, you know, what what if you want to get some money out of the bank, right? I don't know. Like, what if you want to get 100K or 200K or whatever, like what for whatever you want to do? Like, do you, how do, how do you think that goes? And his response, and I see him as a very intelligent, you know, a very intelligent, up-to-date person. And he was like, yeah, I don't know, maybe it takes a while or they ask me what I should use it, what I use it for. And yeah, I don't know. But it, it's just like he didn't see a problem. He just thought it would be a nuisance to wait for like two days or three days. And I was like all riled up. I was like, dude, you like worked for seven years. You got a reward, you know, multi-million euro reward. And now there's, if you call to the bank and say like, hey, I want to get 200K, you're going to have some, you know, 23 year old at a desk job be like oh that's uh, that's over the limit uh, i'm gonna ask you some questions yeah what are you gonna use it for this and that and blah 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 and i said you know like you got this reward and now there's someone you don't know and and someone that doesn't know you who's between you and that reward that what you think you own but but you don't really own it also because you put it in a bank and then i started talking about that but he did he just didn't get it and that was a moment where I was like, okay, I because I learned not to like pitch Bitcoin anymore. Like I wanna, I want to talk with people about the the, the problem of banking or fiat money. You know, like what is the system that you're participating in? Do you understand that? You know, fractional reserve banking. That's what I want to say. And I, after ten minutes, the 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 conversation was kind of dead. Like I I I couldn't even get to the Bitcoin part basically because he didn't really see a problem, and. That really got me thinking combined with these conversations I had with other Bitcoiners, like, okay, if I if I want to contribute to this space, like, what could I do? And then I thought, okay, well, Bitcoin for millennials, you know, like millennials are 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 the biggest demographic. They're gonna be the inherit they're gonna inherit all the wealth from their from their parents, grandparents, you know, they're gonna move into power eventually. So we are the basically the next generation in charge of not only the wealth, but also the power in a sense. But even the most intelligent millennials I know have no clue about how money works. So I think that was one of the biggest triggers for me to be like, okay, I want to do something with Bitcoin for millennials. And then, yeah, I was like, why not another podcast? <laughs> I like to... Uh, to try things myself, like new things. So I thought, okay, podcast, like I have a little, very tiny video experience, no YouTube experience, no presentation experience, whatever. Uh, but I like to talk and have conversations. So I thought, okay, well, maybe this is the, the lowest cost uh, and most effective way for me to contribute. And so that's how I started. It's so much fun. I love podcasting, you know, like I never ex imagined myself having a podcast either. And, uh, but the people you meet and the, the conversations that you get to have are just, uh, I, I agree. I think it, it's such a neat way to contribute to the conversation. There's tons of room for Bitcoin podcasts because 
everybody needs to learn about this stuff. It is, uh, it's the most important thing happening in the world right now. I don't think there's a close second for sure. hundred percent. And I think that's the main, you know, even when you say this right now, I think I hear other people be like, oh yeah, but the hunger in the world or something. Yes, that's, everything is downstream from the money. That is what we have to teach people. You know, broken money creates broken incentives, creates broken uh, results. And therefore, you know, I think for me, it's now so clear that this is such a big topic. This is the biggest topic that we have to discuss. I fully agree with you. And so, yes, why not another podcast? I think it makes sense. And I also see, you know, the adoption of Bitcoin, it goes in waves, not only of understanding, but also in, you know, uh, demographics, types of people. And so every kind of like epoch, right? Like every four years, there's a new new group of people that, yeah, do the work, they they buy, some people sell, some people stick around, you know, but but eventually we see the amount of of uh, adopters and, and people holding Bitcoin grow. And I think with each wave, there's also a new wave of people talking about Bitcoin or educating or explaining. And so it's kind of also how I feel about my own podcast. Like I'm I'm just part of another wave of people trying to uh, inspire, hopefully, and 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 help people to get started on on their own uh, journey into Bitcoin. Yeah. So you uh, you ten x your money, your fiat money. You sold, bought it four hundred, and sold it four thousand. And uh, what was it then? Like, what 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 was the light bulb moment for you? Where you have uh, the the sense of regret that's a very good question because at that point i was like okay i feel great you know like that for me was um it was like in the period of my my first job or just getting out of college so no it was a lot of money for me at at that time the eventual light bulb was i i to be honest i cannot retrace like my full uh journey anymore like i I, yeah i consumed so many podcast articles all these things but i think there there's two main um insights i think that that really did it for me one was uh, when i was 30 i i was i was a bit back into bitcoin i had a mortgage i worked at a bank and then i had a colleague tell me you know like did did you know the money in the bank is not yours and i was like what what are you like what are you talking about but then we had lunch we talked for an hour he explained fractional reserve banking to me and I, and I felt like an idiot. Like uh, I am participating in this system that I truly do not understand. And I think I'm quite an investigative and uh, curious person. I was even working at a bank, but I still had that feeling. And then I was like, okay, this is, this is, uh, yeah, I feel stupid. And, and that's when I started to learn about that more. So, you know, to, when you are paid with, you know, what we call money and you put it in a bank, it's literally not yours anymore. You sign a contract where, you know, basically you say, yeah, uh, when I deposit the money in the bank, I'm actually lending it to the bank and the bank can lend it out again and make money on that. You know, and if the bank goes bust, then my money is gone. And if the bank turns profit on lending out my money, I don't get any of that. You know, and I, I, when I understood that, I was like, okay, this is, this is just really stupid because, and, and this is where I think I'm at now. Like when you have a job or a venture, you take risk, right? You take, every person takes risk in, in doing whatever job or, or whatever venture. And if you're good enough, so if you deliver value, right, you get a reward, which is represented with, with money. And I think you like the analogy too of, you know, it's energy. So you're, 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 your personal productivity is, you know, how you expend energy in a, in a, in a certain amount of time. That's your productivity. And for that, you, you get a reward, but it's risky to find the thing that, you know, gives you that reward and where you can add value. So once you get that reward and you put that reward in a bank, you unknowingly, because most people have no clue how banks work, you take more risk because the bank takes more risk with with your money, but you authorize them to take that risk with that money, right? And so you kind of like take take double risk in that sense. And on top of that, because, you know, the, the banks, private banks are creating money from nothing, right? So if you deposit $100 or euros, they can lend it out like 10 times over. That's money that doesn't really exist. You know, uh, modern day economists will say, well, you know, the value of that money is covered by the promise of the other person to pay back the 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 amount they borrowed which totally makes no sense to me but anyway so the bank takes more risk and 
they create this money because they create more money. The money you got de- gets devalued, right? So if you have a thousand units of whatever currency, you know, which represents the possible reward for all the productivity in a country, and you make that 2,000 units, then each of the previously existing units is worth less in value. And that's the basis of inflation, right? Because then if the money amount doubles, then the price will also double because the value of one unit was cut in half. So you need two units instead of one unit to to pay for something. So you take risk with your job or your venture, then there's risk because you put it in the bank because the bank creates more money units. The money that you already put in or had, you know, gets devalued which then incentivizes you to take more risk because you have to mitigate that that devaluing of of the rewards that you already gathered, right? And so the modern economists think money has to devalue uh, with 2% a year. So you, as just a random citizen, you have to take risk to at least mitigate that, that 2% and then you're kind of square again. It's funny because it takes me so long to explain this but i think this is my point is like nobody understands this and everyone is participating in this right and once you understand that that this is a system that forces you to take more risk that steals your time not only because it's devaluing the reward that you already got for expending energy and time it also devalues your time because you have to spend time to mitigate you know what is supposed to be the two percent devaluation of of that energy that you gathered like i don't want to do that (laughs) you know like i don't i don't want to take more risk i'm a risk averse person and i'm very conscious about my time and i think i'm lucky that i'm wired like that but that combined with the realization that i was participating in a system that i did not understand i think triggered something in me to yeah dive into bitcoin even more and once i realized okay bitcoin is basically a system you know, a protocol, a set of rules for a system of money that cannot be changed, then I just started to move all the economic energy that I gathered in the in the fiat money system, system A to system B, system Bitcoin. And I think that's when I went all in, basically. Like that is, that is I think, my personal thesis there is like, okay, I know that if I take risk with a job or a venture and I get, you know, this economic energy as a reward in return, I do not want to save it in this fiat money banking system. I want to save it in a system that I actually understand, that I can verify for myself, which is, yeah, totally the opposite of of the current system. There, there are so many crazy, uh, you know, it's completely insane, the banking system, because not, not only do they create all this uh, money out of thin air, but in doing that, they raise the level of, they're inflating the price of assets for which they are the ones responsible for lending the money for. So house prices can rise because they can lend out more money to people so that those people can borrow more money to pay higher prices for those things. So it's like they're, they're it's like a, a self-perpetuating machine that they're in control of, which is like how we've all agreed to this is just the craziest uh, aspect of how it all works. And I, the other part of it that really drives me nuts, and this is happening at different pace of uh, depending on where you live in the world, but I think the uh, anti-money laundering limits in Europe are dropping to 400 euros in cash. Uh, like the, the amount of... They are like 3K something. or something. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think in Australia, it starts at $1. Like you have a re- responsibility of reporting cash transactions. And it's just like, so, so you're penalized in so many different ways for for being a willing participant in this system, and it's like it's just because everyone does it because they they maybe just don't necessarily think there's a safe alternative. A hundred percent. I mean, when did you decide to adopt the Canadian dollar as your currency? You didn't. You you never you never did that. There was no conscious decision where you were like, okay, this is the. Uh, and I like this term, you know, this is the political currency that I'm adopting to receive my rewards in, right? You are you are forced to use that political currency because you live in that country. Well, okay, you know, whatever whatever that country wants to do, but you never opted into that or you never were asked like, is this the money you want to use, right? And I, I use this example a lot, like especially in Western countries. And that's also why I like the millennial approach is like, you know, we grew up in the best time to ever grow up of any person who ever lived. Yeah. <laughs> so 
physical safety, you know, housing, water, food. You get coins. You got coins where you were a kid. You went to the store. You gave coins. You got a bread, and you're like, okay, well, this is a, the, apparently this is money. You know, like you never ever questioned or ne- yeah, you were never invited to answer the question, what is money? And once you realize that money should be a natural, a naturally adopted phenomenon, right? What what is the best way for us humans to exchange value? And I think you know the cigarettes in jail, uh, cigarettes or money in jail example is is a really good example, right? Because cigarettes don't come out of thin air, right? A plant grew, a tobacco plant grew, and they did something, you know, to manufacture this thing that has some sort of value, not only in the creation of it, but also in what it does when you consume it, you know, whether you like smoking or not, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, even even people in prison can be rich in cigarettes while they are not smoking them right? Because they know other people find them valuable. And so once you dive into the what is money question and you end up, you know, with uh, with uh, glass beads or the, I don't know about the uh, specific name of the stones, you know, on the island, like it's just a record system. It's a record system for how much do you owe me? Owe me. And at the point of value exchange, I do something for you or I propose something to you, my value proposition to you, and and I say, well, this is this is what I will do for you. This is the value that I propose to deliver to you. And I want a thousand units of you know whatever is the is the money. And then you say, well, okay, can you do it for eight hundred? And then I say, well, no, but I can do it for nine hundred. Okay, we shake hands. That is what it should be about, right? But there is currently some sort of third entity that influences that tool we use or the technology we use to represent that value because i do something for you i expend my energy and time i am productive by i don't know i I always use the building a shed example i don't know i build a shed in your backyard and you give me money in return that represents that energy and we agreed upon you and i agreed upon freely how much of these units are a fair representation of my productivity there but that that exchange is influenced by a third party who doesn't care about your shed and doesn't care about whatever I want to do with the economic energy that I I get or with my job or my venture. You know, maybe I want to build a house or build a family or whatever, but this third entity that influences the, the value of what we use for that reward doesn't care about our individual lives as much as we care about our own individual lives. And I think once I also realized that, I was like, okay, I'm trading my finite time and energy for something that can be created infinitely. That's also not a very smart decision to make. Yeah. As a result of the money becoming worth less, we're all forced to do whatever we can, find a mattress to store it under, whatever we can do to keep it safe. And uh, a lot of people end up trying to put it into that one thing that they think is the most essential need for uh, safe living, which is, uh, which is housing. And, uh, and again, this, this cycle of the, the banks, it's to their advantage to grow their loan book and grow the profits on the interest of the amount that's loaned. And so we, we end up in this cycle where the, the price of, uh, of, a, of a roof over your head is where we're all sort of like actually actively racing to push that number higher and higher, which is just such a counterintuitive decision for, uh, for everyone. And yet we all do it. Yeah. Crazy. But it's because we think we should or something, right? Like, it's just, uh, I used to think that uh, I was, um, well, no, we we do it because we think it works like that, right? But it's it's all based on what other people tell you. And I think that is why also Bitcoin is in some ways very hard to understand, right? The implications, uh, the implications of certain elements of it. I think, I think you can find you know, factually how Bitcoin works. You can find that on the internet. But what is the implication of a system for money that you can totally verify uh, independently as compared to a system of of money that you never even opted into, <laughs> you know, consciously? Just putting those things uh, opposite of each other, I think is already a, a, a very big, a very big topic to think about. If you never thought about money, and then you get a proposition of, you know, would you consciously adopt this money that you can verify for yourself, uh, you know, with all the all the autonomy that that 
that you have just just that already i think is a is a is a big interesting question i mean and i think to add on top of that the idea of a money that would work the same anywhere in the world to me it it one of the craziest things in this day and age is that we would have all these different forms of currency that that behave differently and your money like you can't spend euros in canada so so it's uh Local currencies are also a mechanism to trap money inside a certain physical region. So that that is also something that is is not ideal as a participant in a money system. Yeah. Back to the example of building a shed, right? Let's say you have someone in Canada, someone in Congo, and someone in Taiwan doing the exact same work, same expenditure of, of same uh, materials sourced from the same place, expending of same amount of calories, you know, energy in the same amount of time, right? They will all get rewarded with a reward that's differently valued. So they might agree upon the amount of units, right, of of, of the local currency. But it's pretty crazy that probably the, the guy in Canada can buy like 10 sheds in, in Congo from, from his reward, right? And I think that is eventually also a big point. Whereas, you know, if you say like this was the exact same work, the exact same productivity, the exact same materials, but due to their geographical location, that human productivity gets rewarded at a different level of of value, which I think is the illustration of, of what you also just said, right? And that is eventually also why companies would love or companies countries would love to keep their own currency because that's how they are competitive i mean this is why you know the u.s got so far that it had other countries adopt their currency so they influence the value of the productivity in the country in in liberia right how insane is that this is a great segue into uh you've been working away on a piece called bitcoin is the standard measurement of human productivity have you just summarized the the thesis of that of that piece so I think the the basis of that is is what I already shared, right? If I have a value proposition, I'm on one side of the value exchange, right? I have my proposition and you are the receiver of of that value and you reward me, right? With the reward that that we shake an amount of of currency units that we shake hands upon. At that moment when we shake hands, it's an equal exchange, right? But right after that moment or right after I finish building uh, again the the shed for you and you give me you know a thousand units, a thousand Canadian dollars, let's say. From that moment on, my time and my energy is gone, right? That's been put in the shed, that's gone forever. And so the money should serve as a representation of of that energy as we shook shook hands on. But I don't know what I want to do with that reward right now. You know, I maybe I don't want to spend it right now. Maybe I want to save it towards a house or build a family or move or whatever I want to do into the future, right? And eventually you can connect that to the concept of autonomy or freedom. Like I can do whatever I want with my time that's been given on earth to me. And I don't know how long that is. So that is, you know, that's anyone's challenge, right? How, how do I optimize the time I've been given? Uh, while I don't know how much time I have, basically. And so when I receive that reward and I don't immediately use it, because that reward is influenced by a third party, we, you know, which are the central banks and the, and the private banks, they, they influence the amount of, of money, the amount of units in the, in the total economy. So if they create more units, the units that I already have uh, are being devalued. So the value that it represents today is higher than what it represents in one year or five years or 10 years or however long I want to save it into, you know, time and space. And so this exchange of expending my finite time and energy and getting rewarded in something that can infinitely be created is basically the dumbest trait that, you know, anyone could ever do. I think that's, that's the first thing we need to understand that just as a concept, it doesn't matter which currency or whatever, just finite energy versus infinite energy or energy created from nothing, which cannot even be deemed as energy, right? But rewarded with something that should represent uh, as a constant over time, but it's not. So it's infinitely created and therefore what I receive is devalued over time. So in order to reward human productivity in a proper way, it should be this this, this finite 
one one side of the value exchange is finite, right? My time and energy, my pro- which is my productivity. It should be rewarded in something that's finite as well, but something that is as finite as time, basically. And there's only one thing that can fulfill that function, and that is uh, that is Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is verifiably scarce. Uh, it's 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 finite scarcity as well, and so. It's the only thing that's provably finite in in the in the whole entire world world that could serve as uh, as a value measurement or as a reward for for the human productivity, which is also finite. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's the working intro now. <laughs> so then, if we're thinking about the is this sort of like expansion of that uh, into a, a system, a standardization of measurement for economic activity, what does that look like? Like, how would you explain, um, so we, if we understand the, the concept is basically, you know, finite time and energy traded for a finite money, we're going to scrap this system where we're trying to constantly measure something with a moving yardstick. Uh, what what happens next? So I think the moving yardstick is, is a, is a th- th- that's the first thing to start with, right? So we can agree upon a thousand Canadian units for a certain value proposition at at a certain moment, right? But those thousand units, they live inside an amount of units that, uh, I don't know how it is in Canada, right? But if we look at the dollars, it's unknown how many dollars there are, right? And like 40% of the dollars were created, 40% of the dollars in existence were created in the last four years. So if I operate in that system where the yardstick, right, the, 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 what, what is the value of one unit? What is the value of one dollar, right? And, and price and value is a, is, is a different thing. The one dollar, what is the, what is the energy that's packaged in this one dollar? Basically, that's how I think we should think about it, right? Like, you know, you have the dollar slice pizza, for example, you know, the, 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 either the slice or the price will, will change, right? So, at one point, the slice, the one dollar slice, is maybe two hundred calories, right? And in two years, it could be a hundred calories because they slice the slice, <laughs> you know, in half. But they still call it a slice, right? And I think that's how I like to uh, think about it: is in that kind of like visualization where, you know, we are all connected with each other because we are we are we are trading value all the time, right? Everything you see, you know, came from a certain value exchange. Literally everything you see, even like I look outside, there's a tree growing there. Like someone planted the tree there or the grief, the tree, you know, uh, the seed was brought there by a bird or, 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 or a bee or whatever. I'm getting off topic, but I mean more like everything you see around you, you know, was, it took energy to create or, or maintain basically. So we are trading energy all, all the time with each other, right? Like we are exchanging time right now for no reward while the reward is a bit more intangible than Euros, right? But we are expending our finite time here because we think the reward of that will be will be bigger. That's why we decided to do this, right? So, if you are exchanging energy in a system where the tool you use to represent the the reward for that energy can just be created, then you cannot even visualize what that looks like, right? Like uh, sometimes I say, like, okay, it looks like a globe, but there's no like strong borders. You know, the 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 borders are a bit flaky or gassy or whatever. Like, it's not a uh, a thoroughly defined system that you're operating in, you know, however you want to visualize it. That's kind of my visualization. But with Bitcoin, I see that as a 3D cube that is just set in stone. That, that is the bit, what the Bitcoin protocol represents is uh, a size of that money system, 21 million units, all divided, uh, uh, divisible by 100 million subunits, right? So there's a big 3D cube that's made up of 21 million little cubes. And within that, cube we are exchanging energy with each other and if our productivity grows because we become more uh, productive or efficient or whatever that that 3d cube is not going to grow but the value of each little cube each of the 21 million units that make up the big one is going to grow so i'm not saying price i'm saying value right like how much energy uh, is represented in one of these 21 million cubes. And then I already, in my ear, I hear someone say, but why is the cube growing? That's the entire point. I think that is the discovery of Bitcoin. You know, finite digital scarcity is, there is this set of rules that says, you know, this digital 3D cube 
will never grow beyond the 21 million units that it's comprised of. And all the incentives in this system aim towards that goal. So every 10 minutes, you know, 20,000 nodes in the entire world are checking, are the rules still the rules? Yes, the rules are still the rules. You know, that, that's, that's the entire goal of the nodes. And then every four year with the halving event, you know, that's, that's how the, the new Bitcoins uh, come, in, come into, uh, or the new supply of Bitcoins come into this, this system. They're building up this queue. Every four years, wh- basically what we celebrate is that the protocol, the set of rules is still enforced. That's what we're doing. And I think that is also where the value, if people talk about intrinsic value of Bitcoin, et cetera, I think that is where the intrinsic value is. It's a set of rules. And the set of rules is always followed. There's no deviations. These, these are the rules. And because these are the rules, we can project the path of Bitcoin towards the future. We know that we know when new blocks, new units are added to this 3D cube. And therefore, we can start working towards putting the rewards for our time and energy into this block, which eventually leads to, you know, all the other, you know, second, third order effects like long-term time preference and all these things. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> that's, uh, that, that would be my explanation for yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's the ability to plan for the future with certainty as a result of the, the transparency of the, of the real system. Absolutely. And it makes me, as you're talking about, to think about minimum wage and how the, you know, the reverse concept is true in this system, our current monetary system, where, where we have no ability to plan for the future. And one of the ways that we actually see that is by the constant pressure to raise the minimum wage. And I would expect it's the same in Europe. Right? So how are we possibly saying that, you know, an entry level sort of job at fast food or something? It's the same work. Eight years ago, it had to be it, the minimum you could pay someone is this. But now it's this, and it's it's not a measurement of uh, any additional energy or the value of that productivity. It's simply a measure of the measurement. Exactly. Yeah, uh, I used the uh, example of an apple. Like, do you think the energy that goes into growing an apple has increased over the last ten thousand years? You know, the amount of 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 sunlight it needs and water that throw uh, the, the 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 tree needs to grow the apples on the tree. You know, the amount of energy needed to create one apple has not increased, but the price definitely increases. And and also with the minimum wage, that's a weird spiral, right? Like, okay, so the minimum wage of fast food workers goes up. Of course, then the prices of fast food go up. Well, then the prices of the workers have to go up or else they cannot buy food anymore. Like it's just, and, and then people will, will get fired, right? I think that's also what we see, which is interesting. Like it's a very social policy, right? You get more money. You know, the minimal amount, minimum amount of money you get goes up, but that then incentivizes the companies to just think about ro- robots, right? Like, I mean, there's, there's McDonald's, um, franchises already that are, that are just fully robotic. And so I think policy like that is, 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 is looking at the problem from a d- totally, uh, wrong angle, of course. Like, why do you need more units of a currency? Because each unit of the currency is worth less than a few years before. Like it's not, it's it's not that difficult, I think. Um, but just throwing more units against it, like that, that that is not going to solve the problem. You have to fix the unit of measurement for the human productivity. It's an amazing uh, cognitive dissonance too, because you have a lot of sort of like well-intended people. Just to pick on this minimum wage thing, it's like everyone you know wants. Uh, I would say. It's common to have people want to see people, everyone have a fair opportunity to have a decent life. And so what the the simplest way to reverse engineer that is like, well, everyone needs to make more money. And uh, and it's amazing how few people can see this this systemic issue with the notion of when we measure everything in a, a system where there is a never ending supply of the system of that measurement, the 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 unit of that measurement will will go up forever of everything and like that that yeah yeah so i i don't think i i i also think it's intended in a good way but even the people creating these policies never ask themselves uh, themselves like what is this money that we are talking about right like what 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 is is money they assume uh, wrongfully 
that it is the correct way to value human productivity because, well, they never thought about it in their lives, right? Just like <laughs> we never did before. And so it's, 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 yeah, it's this weird assumption that, you know, yeah, money, money is just money. And that is what we use. Whereas the fiat money that we use is, is only 50 years old, right? It's a blip in the history of money itself. So what, what we actually call money is, is not even money. <laughs> you know, I mean, one of the characteristics of money is store value. Well, if I built that shed for you now and you give me a thousand, a thousand Canadian uh, dollar units, then I cannot store that value for the next five years because it, it will represent less. So it, it, I think that's one example of how what we currently think is money is already broken beyond uh, repair. Yeah, I mean, and what we really think of as money is really square pieces of colorful plastic with the pictures of people's faces that we recognize, and and that's that's really all it is. It's uh, I have people think about it like uh, you know Scrooge McDuck with his safe, you know, with all the coins and the bills in it. Like they think that the number in their banking app actually represents something similar to that, right? But it's literally just a number in a database. And I had um, Bert de Groot, who was on my podcast. He told me, you know, what's, you know what's crazy? If your enemies know where the database is, where you store those numbers that are shown in the app and you bomb the database, the money is gone like the, because the numbers are gone. And I, I thought that was a very interesting thought. Like it's, it's literally just a number in an accounting database. That is what you see. That is what you derive well, what some people derive their their happiness from or their success or their failure or whatever. It's literally just a number in the database. It does not represent anything, anything tangible. Like it's not real. It's literally not there. Not like you think how Scrooge McDuck has like coins and, and stuff in his safe. Like it's, it's literally not there. It doesn't exist. Yeah. And if you did go to ask for it, there's a good chance that they would tell you no, that you can't have it. Because that's happening also all over the world with banks. Or what are you going to use it for? Like just that, just that, just just the, the 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 thinking about that. I mean, I mentioned you know my talk with my friend. I it, we were sitting in that car, and it just infuriated me that he didn't see it. You know, where I was like, "You fucking suffer. Do you hustle? You know." And now you don't even own what you think is your reward, but there's also someone in between who's going to ask you questions about what you want to do with your reward. Like, you know, wake up. <laughs> you should just realize this is not the way. It's really crazy. I think that eventually people will come around to the importance of the uncensorability of Bitcoin. But it's um, it's shocking today how, you know, I think in Canada it's a little bit more real because there was a mass freezing of bank accounts and uh, was a sort of very, uh, a lot of people were paying attention to that. And a lot of people know people who had their bank accounts frozen. But uh, even still, uh, and, and ge- sort of generally talking to people, I would say more people don't care than do. And, uh, it's that weird, you know, trust of the system that you were adopted into at birth. And, uh, uh, like you said, it's, it's not even that old of a system. So well, it's also, it's not, it's not, it's not weird that people don't question it. Like, as you said, you were born into it and yeah, like I mentioned before, you get some coins when you're a child, you go to a store, you exchange and you think like, okay. You know, like, so it's not, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's, it's weird that people don't think about it. Like, yeah, especially in Western countries, you have no reason to question the money, but eventually, eventually you will, because at one point, you know, if you want to buy a house or you want to start a family and, you know, you think that works just like, you know, your parents or your grandparents did, well, you know, that that's that's where the wake up call uh, I think uh, comes for a lot of people. Let's talk about Bitcoin for millennials a little bit. Do you have a favorite uh, a favorite guest or a favorite episode that you like to that you're proud of or like to rewatch when you're looking for something to put on? Yeah. So I I when I started I was like okay what what is well, you know what is my goal what do what do I want to get out of it so I adopted the the Mr Beast strategy which is basically you know you make uh, he always says like you make 100 episodes or videos of whatever well whatever you want to create and then after 100 episodes you know if you like what you're doing you get to learn YouTube and thumbnails and you know your workflow whatever but you also you know, figure out if people like what you're doing, if they want to subscribe to you, maybe you can earn some money or whatever. So he he says like, okay, uh, and, and also I think the biggest lesson is 
just staying consistent and and keep doing the work until you get to 100 episodes. So that's kind of how I started. That's still my my main uh, goal. Uh, and then I just made a list of like people I wanted to talk to, and I made a top five, which is like Safe Dino Moose, Jeff Booth, uh, Sailor, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, and I'm thinking about fifth. Anyway, so Jeff Booth was in there, and I thought, okay, you know, at first I'm going to get some some episodes in, and then I'm going to uh, reach out. I don't know, see uh, see if people if these people want to come on. And then uh, after nine episodes, uh, I had. Uh, Jeff in my DM, I don't know, replied to some tweet and then he sent me a DM and I was like, okay, well, I wanted to ask you later, but now that we're talking, would you want to be on my podcast uh, on the 10th episode? And he was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, wow, okay. So it was just really fun to uh, reach that after 10 episodes, just just having someone that that is in my top five. And uh, I think he is probably the best person to to talk about I think what we also just talked about, like what is this paradigm that we live in that we never question? How does that, you know, what does it look like if you're consciously searching for, you know, what could another paradigm be? Can I look at that new paradigm from the existing paradigm or should I just go? And then when I look back, I know that I made the right decision. I think he talks about that I, I think it's a struggle. It's it's a learning journey. I think he talks about that in the, probably the most eloquent way that, that anyone can talk about that. And I think that really also helped me just build my conviction. And I think what he talks about is very timeless. You know, like it's as, as long as fiat money exists, this is one of the most relevant people to, to talk to because he, uh, and I have his book here, his book is called The Price of Tomorrow. I think, you know, we also mentioned that like what prices should go down. You know, like we are, you know, humans are productive and they want to be more efficient. You know, they want to have more output with less energy. Like that is our entire, uh, I almost want to say reason of existence, like to, to eventually get there. And so everything should become cheaper and more affordable and more uh, available, widely available. But, and, and I love the example of bread, you know, like in the 1920s, a bread was 25 cents and now it's $4 or 4 euros. So do you think we've become more efficient at creating bread, you know? And the answer is no. And I think that's a great illustration of where we are with the fiat money system is that, you know, 100 years apart, the the bread is like um, like 20 times more expensive nutritionally probably worse and that is the actual problem that that we are talking about because jeff says the price of tomorrow should be zero <laughs> you know eventually it's zero and we live in, in in abundance and everything is free and available so that we can actually spend time on this is what i make of it but like spend time on figuring out you know uh, i just told you off mic but like when you look at the stars that we can have time and be like what the hell is going on here you know what are we here to do you know what 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 is this body? What is my mind? Am I talking? Who's listening? Like stuff like that, you know, like more and more that that um, that spiritual exploration versus really being stuck in the physical world. I think that is what, what fiat money does. And so, uh, yeah, Jeff Booth is still one of my favorite uh, favorite people. And uh, I've listened to that episode three times myself. I, I, I don't listen to a lot of episodes again, but I I just love how he explains that. Jeff's a, just a visionary. And uh, Price of Tomorrow was actually the book that started my Bitcoin journey. I, I read it without really even realizing it was a Bitcoin book. Completely flipped me upside down. And uh, he was on the, he, you know, we, he's been on uh, Block Reward as well. And it was a really cool moment for me having the opportunity to talk to him. And I've met him a few times since. And uh, yeah, every every person I can, I, I steer to Jeff and Jeff's work as I just think that as many people as possible need to hear his message because he has just such an amazing way of articulating it and he's uh, in just such a calm disposition that it's like it's almost impossible to dismiss right on uh bram so for uh, for people who want to find you online uh or find more of your work what was the best way we'll include all the links but uh, anywhere that you want to root people specifically well you can find uh, bitcoin for millennials on uh, youtube and any podcast uh platform so that's uh, just search for bitcoin for millennials it's uh, like an orange avatar and if you want to follow me on uh, Twitter X, it's uh, uh, B R A M K. That's my account. Cool. This has been Ryan, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you.
Appreciate your time. And uh, and if you're listening and you made it all the way to the end of the show, I want to thank you as well for tuning in. I uh, appreciate your attention and hope to see you again next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Block Reward. We're trying to do something different here, creating accessible conversations meant for people who aren't obsessed with Bitcoin. If you found this episode informative and engaging, hit that subscribe button to make sure you stay updated with future episodes. Your feedback matters. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a moment to share your reviews and help us with our goal of creating Bitcoin content that is simple and easy to understand. Bitcoin has an important role to play in the future of finance. It will change the way we save, spend, and invest. Discover why Bitcoin offers a game-changing opportunity for forward-thinking employers by visiting blockrewards.ca. BlockRewards' mission is helping Canadian employers implement strategies for integrating Bitcoin into compensation and benefits. Supercharge your recruitment and retention strategies and help your team members plan for the rising cost of living by rewarding their work with the hardest money ever invented. Special thanks to our top sponsor, Paramount Employee Benefits Consulting, Canada's only Bitcoin Forward Benefits and Pension Advisory. For more information, find them at paramountbenefits.ca. Big shout out to Podigy, our production team that makes all this possible, and BMX Escape for producing our music. Bitcoin is an expansive and dense topic many people walk away from early. To Bitcoin enthusiasts looking for that podcast they can share with friends, family, and colleagues, one they'll actually listen to, we hope that is us. The content of these conversations is meant to be provided for information purposes only. Nothing here is investment advice. Bitcoin is a big topic. Be sure to do your own research before making any personal financial decisions. Thanks for listening. 